So uh, let's get started. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Daji Kawaguchi, and uh, I'm a professor of economics at the uh, University of Tokyo. Thank you for joining us for the keynote lecture of ASLA. Uh, we are very pleased to host the presentation by Professor Patrick Klein. Patrick Klein is a professor of economics at UC Berkeley and a research, faculty research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. His research focuses on the determinants of wage inequality and the effectiveness of the public policies designed to combat inequality. Professor Klein is a following editor of the Review of Economic Studies and serves as associate editor at the Journal of Political Economy, Econometrica, and uh, Econ American Economic Journal, Applied Economics. Professor Klein is a leading uh, expert on the economics of uh, imperfectly competitive uh, labor market, uh, place-based uh, place policies, and the program evaluation method. In 2018, he was awarded the Shawin Rosen Prize for outstanding contribution to the field of labor economics. The title of Professor Klein's talk is Systematic Discrimination Among Large U.S. Employers. Professor Klein's talk will last about 35 minutes. Afterward, we will have a time for a Q&A session with the audience. Please feel free to submit any questions via the chat function at the bottom of your screen. With that, I will hand things off to Professor Klein. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me all right through these headphones? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Let me see if I can share my screen successfully. All right. Can we see the slides advancing here? Yes. Excellent. Okay. All right. So uh, thank you very much. Um, this is a joint work with um, Evan Rose and my colleague, uh, Chris Walters. Uh, we're gonna be studying uh, discrimination among large US employers as the title suggests. Um, let's see if I can advance my slides. So in the US, uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act prohibits discrimination on the basis of so certain protected characteristics, including race, sex, color, religion, and national origin. Um, there is a very large literature um, throughout the social sciences, actually, uh, that uses so-called correspondence studies to measure average levels of discrimination in a given labor market against these protected characteristics. So um, in economics, many are familiar with the uh, seminal work by uh, uh, Bertrand and Mullenathan, but um, there's actually a large uh, sociology literature and many other social sciences use these types of methods. And the reason for their popularity is that we are able to directly manipulate perceptions of, um, uh, of protected characteristics in a ceteris paribus fashion that allows us to hold all other explanations for differences in employer responses constant. However, although we found that um, there tends to be um, quite a lot of bias against um, particular uh, traits such as uh, having a distinctively black name, uh, we don't have much evidence on whether that bias is concentrated in particular companies. And so what we're gonna investigate today is to what extent discrimination is concentrated in particular large firms. This is of interest for a number of reasons, uh, not least of which is that the US government ex has an entire um, unit devoted to enforcement of the Civil Rights Act and in particular within that unit, that that unit would be the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. They're specifically interested in so-called systemic discrimination. Now that word gets used throughout the social sciences in different ways, but what the EEOC means when they use that word is a pattern or practice policy and or class cases where the discrimination has a broad impact on an industry, profession, company, or geographic location. Um, as EEOC Chair Jenny Yang under the Obama administration uh, noted in a review of this uh, literature, tackling, dis tackling systemic discrimination is central to the mission of the EEOC. In fiscal year 2020, the EEOC launched 538 systemic investigations through their systemic investigation unit. There's also um, uh, elevated 
requirements for federal contractors in the US. They have to um, enact um, affirmative action plans and they are uh, held to a higher standard for guaranteeing equal employment. That's enforced by the Office of Federal Contract Compliance, which regularly does audits of particular companies. And so they're worried, they're, they're particularly concerned about whether the hiring practices um, or patterns followed by particular large organizations that contract with the federal government are fair or not. Um, okay, so the way that we're going to measure this is using a new type of correspondence experiment. Um, rather than going to an online job board and kind of passively lurking and uh, applying to whatever jobs pop up first, we're going to proactively target um, particular uh, large U.S. employ uh, large U.S. employers, so companies that are in the uh, Forbes Fortune five or the Fortune five hundred companies. Um, so for each of these large companies, we're going to apply to as many as one hundred twenty five geographically distinct uh, jobs from each firm. By geographically distinct, I mean that they're in separate U.S. counties, and we're doing that uh, both to um, be able to assess whether. This is something that's nationwide, a nationwide pattern of discrimination. And because we don't want this everything to be driven by, you know, sort of the same hiring manager. Um, eight applications are sent to each job. We got a total sample size of 84,000 applications. That's roughly 20 times as large as the famous Petrina Mullen Nathan study. The experiment was organized in five waves. It ended up spanning the COVID pandemic. Um, and this lets us uh, test whether there's something stable both across time and across the US in terms of the conduct of particular companies. Um, so we have two goals. One is measurement. Uh, we wanna see how much bias there is um, out there. And so are particular companies uh, more biased than others? And uh, is that, how does that compare to other groupings of jobs such as industry, state, or job title? And then second, given what we've learned about what's out there, we're going to ask, can we actually use the statistical information that we found to detect discrimination by particular companies? In other words, it's one thing to say that, say, 30 out of the 100 companies that we um, have in our experiment are likely discriminating. It's another to say which company, which 30 are discriminating. And so we'll talk about how to borrow methods from uh, the empirical Bayes methods, to, uh, the empirical Bayes uh, literature and statistics to uh, answer questions like that. And we'll in particular talk about um, how uh, methods that have been popularized in biostatistics for controlling false discoveries can be useful for thinking about how to target uh, anti-discrimination policies. Um, okay, so this obviously relates to uh, many different literatures. Um, there's a huge social science literature on correspondence experiments, but we still don't know much about um, where the bias is coming from on average. Um, we, we know that it differs across jobs. Um, we don't know how much the kind of discriminatory jobs are clustered in particular organizations. Um, let's talk about the details of our experiment. So we started with the Fortune 500 companies um, then uh, we narrowed down to 125, 123 firms that had sufficient uh, flow of jobs um, that was uh, nationwide to be able to audit um, according to the design that we wanted to use. 180 of these companies turned out to have centralized job portals uh, on their company homepages that were feasible to audit with the technology that we used. Um, the U.S. employment at these 108 firms that we were able to audit is uh, 15 million uh, in 2020, according to CompuStat. Um, there was there were some interruptions due to COVID, and so of the 108, 72 were sampled in all five waves of the experiment. 36 were only sampled in a subset of the waves. Um, in each wave, we sampled 25 uh, vacancies in uh, distinct counties, uh, and as I mentioned before. Each uh, job was sent eight applications. We stratified uh, to have four distinctively white and four distinctively black applications sent uh, to each job. Otherwise, the characteristics were uh, randomly assigned. Um, so uh, how did we make these resumes? Uh, we uh, signaled where we manipulated employer perceptions of race and gender using uh, distinctive first names. 
last names uh, were taken from the census. Age was uh, manipulated via uh, indirectly via the year of high school graduation. Most employers do not allow you to directly uh, volunteer your age because they're not allowed to make decisions based upon that. So it's not asked on applications. Um, as I mentioned, we stratified on race. We also manipulated a, a variety of other characteristics that I'm not going to have time to talk about today. Uh, indicators of LGBTQ affiliation, gender identity. Um, we, some of our applications uh, were given associate's degrees. Um, there was um, many uh, centralized portals these days ask you to fill out a personality test. And so we automated all of that and everything was um, done in a way that ensured there was no human discretion involved. Everything was uh, uh, answered in a way that was a random draw from a known probability distribution that we designed. Um, here's an example of what the resumes look like. So whenever uh, we were allowed to, we compiled uh, PDFs of our um, random resumes and we uploaded them. Um, so here we have uh, Joshua Erickson. This is a distinctively white and male name. Um, however, this application, this is one of the few that has a preferred pronoun listed. So we wanted to see whether there was discrimination against uh, listing pronouns. In this case, they have uh, they and them as their uh, pronoun. Um, the education history, this is a real high school. Um, these are real uh, employers in the area. Um, and these references, you can see that we even randomized the uh, color of uh, and the watermark used on the resume. Um, so Maurice Randall, that's a distinctively black name that doesn't have a preferred pronoun in here. It has um, a different email provider. Uh, again, these are real um, establishments and uh, uh, Maurice Randall went to a community college. Okay, this was all done by our crack team of RAs who eventually automated themselves uh, out of a job because we got so good at creating bots to submit this in a, in a um, systematic way online. So let's take a first look at the data. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, we had about 84,000 uh, applications submitted. Um, we had uh, uh, almost a perfect balance between um, uh, male and female applications. White and black, uh, there was direct stratification on race. So um, we sent things out in pair, white, black pairs. Um, in some cases, um, a vacancy uh, closed down was filled before we were able to send the second member of the pair. So we don't have exactly perfect balance on the number of white and black applications sent, but it's almost perfect. Um, we have a good balance on uh, all the baseline characteristics, uh, except for associate's degree, which is only borderline and that's a chance and balance. If you do an F test, uh, the randomization worked. So what did we find for uh, contact rates? So we monitored everything um, in an automated way to see if we were, con if an employer left a email, a voicemail or a text message. Um, so the total uh, contact gap between distinctively black and distinctively white callbacks was about two percentage points off of a base of 23 percentage points, uh, I want to point out that it seems that employers took our resumes very seriously. This might be the highest um, callback rate ever in a um, large scale audit study. Um, the uh, original Bertrand and Mullen Nathan uh, study was um, less than half of this callback rate. Um, between uh, male and female uh, names, uh, there was no difference. Um, so you can see that this was uh, insignificant. Uh, for those uh, applications that have a year of high school graduation suggesting that they're over age 40, there's a very small penalty of about half a percentage point um, that is significant, but uh, only kind of uh, borderline. Um, okay, so let me uh, take a quick look at uh, interactions. Uh, so we've got that uh, the um, among Female uh, applications, the uh, white black penalty is uh, larger. There's a large literature in sociology and legal studies on intersectionality about how um, intersecting dimensions of disadvantage can be worse than the sum of their parts. Um, and that's kind of borne out here, although with any type of uh, interaction, you can always think about it two different ways. One way to look at this is that actually it's saying that for white applications, applications, 
there's a bonus to listing a female name, whereas for black applications, there's a penalty. Um, uh, there's not too much else here. Um, let me uh, move on. So you might wonder, you know, how much of what we're seeing is actually the whiteness or blackness of the name versus something else about the name. So here we've color coded the um, callback rates by the applicant's first name. So we have the callback rate for each name that we used in the experiment. It's, co it's color coded by the race and gender of the name. And so we just do a simple F test for whether um, there's any variation within race and gender cell. And you can't reject that all that's going on here is um, that there's different differential treatment by race and gender. Okay, so almost all the variants, you can't reject that literally all the variants in the treatment of the, across the names in terms of the callback rates is attributable to their race and sex. Okay, so now let's move on to what is really interesting, which is thinking about groupings of jobs. So uh, what we're really after is understanding the firm component of variation and discrimination, but there's other rival explanations for things too. There's of course a lot of interest in geography and industry. So we're gonna take a crash course here in, uh, in uh, variance decomposition. So we're some basic notation. So we're gonna think about the contact gap um, at job J a firm F as delta FJ. So this is what you would get in principle if you had run the experiment over and over and over again. Okay, so these are like the population parameters that we're interested in. Um, for, um, uh, for race, delta FJ is just the white contact rate minus the black contact rate. Um, the mean contact gap at a firm is just delta F. So you just drop the job subscript. Um, and so this is telling you the contact gap you would expect at a randomly sampled job from firm F. Okay, if you we could have run this, we could have sampled different jobs from the same firm. So we could have done that, you know, over and over and over again. And this is what it would settle down to is delta F. Okay, so random sampling of jobs plus random assignment of protected characteristics plus no interference between units implies that our estimated contact gap. Um, at a firm is going to, sorry, our, our expected value of any job specific um, estimated contact gap is um, the population contact gap for that job if we've conditioned on the identity of the job. If we don't condition on the identity of the job, it's giving us uh, an unbiased estimate of the firm wide average contact gap. Okay. All right. So, the first question is, do those um, delta Fs, the firm-wide average contact gaps, differ across firms, or are they all the same level of average bias? And for that, we can just start with just a simple chi-squared test of heterogeneity, okay? Um, and these are the p-values down here, and you can see that we easily reject the null that all firms discriminate on the basis of race equally. We easily reject that they all discriminate on the basis of gender equally, which is kind of interesting because I told you that the mean callback rate for men and women was the same. So the average treatment effect, if you will, is zero, but the variance of the treatment effects must not be zero. Um, and for race, we can also, I'm mean, sorry, for age, we can also reject that they're all the same. Okay, now we can do something more sophisticated than that. We can go beyond uh, the test of whether all the effects are equal into a directional test. So here, what we're doing is using uh, uh, approach uh, developed by by Santos and Shaikh, and what they're they're thinking about uh, high dimensional moment inequalities, but actually testing that delta F is um, non negative for all the firms corresponds to a test of the direction of discrimination. So here we're interested in um, are some companies discriminating against whites and some discriminating against blacks, or um, is it only one sided? So here we've got the p value for the null that there's no discrimination against each group. So here, oh, this is one, this is telling you, we certainly cannot reject the null that there's no discrimination against white applicants. Whereas for blacks, the p-value is zero. We easily reject the null that there's no discrimination against black names. For male names, we easily re reject the null that there's no discrimination. For female names, we also reject the null, although it's a little bit more marginal. The p-value is only 0.05. For older workers, we can reject 
and all that there's no discrimination against older workers. Um, for younger workers, there may not be any discrimination. Okay. Here we have variance components. So the idea behind uh, this is that we, the, when you take the variance of the estimated contact gaps at each firm, you've got the true signal variance plus the noise in each of your contact gaps, an average level of noise. And so the way that we do a bias correction here is we've got standard errors that are unbiased for every um, uh, firm contact gap, and we're going to subtract out the square standard error. Now, for the econometrics nerds um, watching this, um, it turns out that in this case, and we talk about this in the paper, subtracting out the square standard error uh, yields a U statistic, which um, if you're not familiar with that is, what, what, what that means is it's you've got a representation as taking all of the pairwise cross products of um, the uh, jobs within the same firm. And so those cross products are all estimating each, you know, job specific contact gap is an unbiased estimate of the firm contact gap. And so you have two estimates of the same thing. If they're independent, if we take their product, they're giving us an estimate of the square of the thing. And so um, you can think about this as kind of like an average covariance in contact, job specific contact gaps for two jobs drawn from the same firm very close to the older literature on interclass correlations. So we're finding a lot of variance um, in, uh, in each dimension. So the standard deviation of race contact gaps is 1.8 percentage points. That's about as big as the mean contact gap, which was two percentage points. Um, for gender, remember the mean effect was zero and we're getting a 2.6 percentage point uh, standard deviation of uh, bias. For age, we're getting one percentage point, although these are p-values, so this is kind of, um, I'm sorry, these are standard errors. This is kind of borderline uh, in terms of significance. Now, you can also ask how stable are these contact gaps? So here um, in, oops, sorry, in columns, column four, what we've done is we've taken this u-statistic idea where I told you it was the average covariance, or the average, yeah, the average covariance between, and the gaps for two jobs drawn from the same firm, you can also think about what is the covariance across waves of the experiment um, within the firm. So you take the average gap in wave one for a given firm and the average gap for in wave two for a firm, and you take their covariance um, across firms. And that's almost the same uh, estimate. And so that's a sign that we have a very temporally stable uh, variance component. You can do the same thing across geography, and again, you get almost the same numbers. So it's a geographically widespread, geographically stable, and temporally stable phenomenon. Okay, how does FIRM compare to other groupings of jobs? Let's start with geography. Surprisingly, uh, for race, we, we find a very small or relatively small um, variance component across states. So it explains only about 25% of the variance um, that firm groupings explain. For gender and for age, we actually find uh, wrong signed variance components. So we certainly can't reject that those are insignificant. Uh, so the, sorry, can't reject that those are zero. Um, industry turns out to be important. Industry explains about half of the uh, variance across firms for both race and gender, and again, we must be, because the mean effect was zero, we must be finding discrimination in both directions, that so there's some companies that are biased against men and some that are biased against women. How about job titles? So job title also turns out to be pretty big, but you have to remember that, you know, jobs, job titles are unequally uh, assigned to different types of firms. And so turns out if we, um, condition in a two-way fixed effects model for firm dummies as well. So if we ask, is there any variation across job titles within a company in terms of their level of bias, we can't reject that we can't reject that there is not. So it seems to all be explained by the firms that these job titles are clustered in. And I'll show you more evidence of that in a little bit. Okay, so here's the formal test. So if you do a two-way fixed effects variance decomposition, you get that um, 
here's the p-value on the null that there are no that none of it is explained by firms that's easily rejected here's the p-value on the null that uh, none of it is explained by in this column job title we can't reject in this case geography we also can't reject so it looks like um, this is all the job title effect is all an artifact of discriminatory job titles being clustered in particular um, uh, discriminating firms. Okay, so we'd like to know how this um, relates to observables, right? We don't want to get too carried away with unobservables. So here, um, what we're doing is just simply uh, regressing the uh, job specific co uh, contact gaps on observable characteristics of the job and the local area. So uh, we don't find much here. Um, it's tempting to look at this for a long time, but the closest we find uh, to a predictor at the job level is local sentiment. This, the, the, the key variables are the county uh, race IAT. IAT is an implicit association test very popular test in the psychology literature and gender IAT. So these are both places where, based upon the psychological tests that people have taken online, um, there seems to be more bias against uh, African-Americans or against women. They tend to have larger black-white contact gaps. But if we do a joint test with firm fixed effects, we can't uh, reject and all that jointly these are all zero. So this might be all noise. However, at the firm level, we find lots of important correlates of firm-wide discrimination. So the first one that's you know, a classic from economic theory, going back to Becker's uh, dissertation, is that uh, the profitability of a firm is a negative predictor of how discriminatory it is. So put differently, uh, the more uh, racist firms appear to be less profitable. Um, Interaction with the federal government is a negative predictor of uh, discrimination, either whether you've been um, fined or sued for discrimination or other types of labor violations that makes you less likely to discriminate. Um, federal contractors, as we would expect, are much less likely to discriminate. Um, measures of firm diversity are not that predictive of discrimination. Um, and the most important um, uh, and clearest signal for a predictor for a discrimination is a measure that we constructed of callback centralization. So for this, what we did was um, we looked at the number of uh, distinct jobs from the employer that called us back. Um, so uh, if it, put differently, we, we recorded every phone number that contacted us. And so if only if the same phone number called us back, Suppose we were called back 50 times. If all 50 of those contacts were from the same phone number, then we were completely centralized. Whereas if 50 distinct phone numbers called us back, then it was completely decentralized. And so we had scaled this between zero and one uh, because um, we'd be using the callbacks twice to avoid a mechanical correlation. We use split sample IV here and use one half sample to instrument the other. Um, but uh, this is a very strong negative predictor of discrimination. So let me be more precise. So what this is saying is companies that seem to have more centralized um, contact, which might reflect the centralization of their HR policies, um, are less likely to discriminate. And we think that that is um, a clue about what might be going on that basically process within the company um, can slow people down and get them to be uh, a little bit less biased. Um, okay, uh, we can also look at, you know, what types of jobs people are doing. I told you before that um, job title unconditional on firm effects is, is predictive. Here, uh, we've linked the job titles to the uh, dictionary of um, occupational titles or whatever, you know, the ONET data, and we've tried to talk, we've tried to code things up in terms of whether um, the jobs are customer facing or not. And so um, customer facing jobs seem to be more biased um, against black names and also more biased against male names. All right, so those were the mean effects. Um, the uh, 
I'm not sure what's going on here. Okay. Now uh, we're going to go beyond variances and try to recover the entire distribution of discrimination. So uh, here we're going to apply a deconvolution estimator proposed by Brad Efron. So this is the idea here is we have a hierarchical model. So we've got a noisy signal of the bias delta hat f, but can, there's some latent true level of bias delta f without the hat, and then s is our standard error. Okay, so we're going to assume by by the central limit theorem we've got you know a thousand apps to every company. We're going to invoke a CLT and say we've we've gone to a normal distribution with no invariance, and then we're going to further assume that these truth these true bias levels are IID draws from some distribution G. We're going to try to estimate that G. So we do that imposing, in the case of race, a shape constraint that there's no discrimination against whites because the data were consistent with that. And we're going to regularize our kind of, it's, this is basically, the Efron thing is basically a penalized maximum likelihood procedure. We're going to choose the penalty term to exactly match the unbiased variance estimate we had from the previous section. Okay, so here in this picture, this histogram is showing you a histogram of the noisy um, contact gaps. The deconvolved density is what our penalized maximum likelihood procedure recovers as the signal density after you've accounted for the measurement errors. And you can see, as I mentioned, that it's not allowing any discrimination against whites. Okay, so that's the shape constraint. And what, what are we seeing here? We see that many firms have very uh, slight levels of bias against black names, but then there's this tail off here of heavy discriminators. For gender, things are almost perfectly centered around zero, right? And that's consistent with having found a mean effect of zero. But there are these tails of, of discrimination in both directions. If you were to compare these to some familiar parametric distributions, we're finding that for race, you get something that looks a lot like a log normal. For gender, it's so peaked, it's even more peaked than a Laplace density, okay? So this is, it's as if there really is um, kind of almost a mass point at zero for gender discrimination. We can convert these into CDFs and then use those CDFs to, um, to um, summarize the inequality and discrimination with a Lorenz curve. So um, here we can see that the uh, for race, that the top 20% uh, most discriminatory uh, companies are responsible for almost half of the last of the lost callbacks. Um, for gender, we use the absolute value um, and the top 20% are responsible for about 60% of the lost callbacks on the basis of gender. The Gini coefficient for uh, racial discrimination across companies is about what you would have found for the US income inequality level in the 1990s. Whereas gender, it's so unequal, it's more like modern Brazilian income inequality. Okay, so we've shown that there's bias out there and it's very concentrated in a minority of employers. Can we discern the identity of those employers? That's a conceptually separate question. So to answer that, we're gonna take two approaches. The first is the kind of empirical based posterior mean approach that you see often applied in the value added literature. So we compute the non-parametric posteriors. Um, this shaded area is the posterior mean can see, as you'd expect, it's a shrinkage style estimate. It's less dispersed than what's really out there, but it's your best predictor. So here are the posterior means by industry. You can see that racial discrimination is concentrated in the auto sector, eating and drinking establishments, apparel stores, food stores. So this is consistent with what I told you before. It's the more customer facing sectors, whereas engineering services, security brokers, freight and transport, they have much lower levels of discrimination against black names. For Gender, as we talked about before, things are two-sided. So wholesale durables, um, there's discrimination against women, whereas apparel stores, lots of discrimination against men. And as you can imagine, that um, there, that's particularly um, concentrated in women's apparel. So let's take the perspective now of 
a hypothetical um, bureaucrat with the U.S. government whose job it is to enforce um, anti-discrimination law, right? They can investigate companies that seem suspicious. If they knew the true contact gaps, um, they would presumably want to um, investigate the most heavy discriminators first. And so we can think about this blue line as kind of a production possibilities frontier. If you get, if you rank all the companies by who's the heaviest discriminator and you investigate the most heavy discriminator first and then the second most and third most, you'd be along this blue frontier. But we don't know the truth, right? We just know, and this blue frontier, by the way, is just a reshaping of the CDF that I showed you before, right? The same thing that we used in the Lorenz curve. Um, but we don't know the truth, right? We just have an estimate of the truth. And so these posterior means in this uh, dashed line are showing you what you can achieve if you make decisions based upon the posterior mean, taking into account that it's going to make mistakes about who's the, who's the most heavy discriminator and so on. Okay, and so this is kind of the price we pay for not knowing who's who ahead of time. We make mistakes and we pushes our, our possibilities frontier inwards. It's still pretty good though, right? If we contrast that with this uh, inverse 45 degree line, it's telling us, you know, this is what you would get if you investigated companies at random. If you investigate all the companies, you save about a uh, little bit more than 20 callbacks per thousand. That's consistent with having the two percentage point contact gap um, mean difference that I showed you at the very beginning of the talk. Okay. But a different way to go, rather than making decisions based upon the mean, would be to make decisions based upon whether there's any discrimination at all. So, in particular, we've imposed some smoothness in making these plots, and the world might not be smooth. It might be that there's many companies that just don't discriminate at all, and the U.S. legal system, you know, it doesn't really have a, or even, you know, you could put the legal system Aside, the way that investigations work, it's kind of an adversarial process where the company says, no, I'm innocent. I didn't do anything wrong. Um, so to deal with that, it, there's some appeal to instead trying to get the posterior, not the posterior mean, but the posterior probability that the contact gap is greater than zero, um, which you can think of as kind of the extensive margin. So here we're going to use, uh, introduce the concept of a, false discovery rate, okay? So here we can think about this as a multiple testing problem, right? We've we've got, you can run T tests at every company, you've got 108 companies. Here's the histogram of p-values that come out of all those T tests. If no one was discriminating, then this histogram should be flat because the p-values should be uniformly distributed under the null. We can see that that's not the case, right? So we know someone's discriminating, but who should we sig single out as who should we label as a discriminator? The way that we're going to think about that is that there's a two type mixture at play here. So there are true nulls, those who aren't discriminating at all, those have a uniform distribution. And then there's the false nulls that have uh, p values concentrated near zero. Now, what we don't know is which fraction of nulls are true. That's the pi naught, so it has to be in zero one. Um, so the false discovery rate of a rule that rejects all the nulls with p values below some threshold p by Bayes rule is just equal to this ratio. So this is your prior probability that the null is true times the p value, okay, divided by the CDF of p values. So saying what fraction of companies have p values smaller than mine, okay? So what we're going to do is base decisions on the so-called Q value. That's kind of your estimate of the false discovery rate, um, your empirical estimate. If the Q value is 0.05, then we expect that um, only one out of every 20 nulls that we reject was actually true. Or put differently, at least 19 out of every 20 firms with P values below P hat F are going to um, actually be engaged in discrimination. Um, okay, looks like I'm running out of time. So, make a long story short, we find 23 companies are discriminating against 
um, black names with the while controlling the false discovery rate to 5%. Um, here are those 23 companies. I'm not showing you their names, but we know them. They're as expected concentrated in the auto dealers and services sector, and many of them are federal contractors. Um, making decisions based on Q values instead of posterior means cost you very little in terms of the expected yield of the investigation role. Um, I was going to show you guys maps that these are truly national level patterns. This is for a particular federal contractor. This should be very upsetting uh, to people that work on this kind of stuff. Um, and so we think that this um, information can actually be used to um, combat discrimination in various ways. One way is to have better enforcement of the law. Another way is to actually share the information uh, with the world through some sort of report card that's careful not to overstate the precision of what we've estimated, but that um, um, provides information for both the companies themselves and for uh, potential job seekers to use to make better decisions. Um, okay, that's it. I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, you received several questions in the chat box and um, Ming Hai Zhou uh, have a question. How your results are driven by the use of applicant tracking system, i.e. Uh, pre-programmed software to screen out CVs, which are said to be very common among large employers? Thank you. Yeah, sure. So um, I think that the fact that we have the highest contact rate ever um, suggests that our CVs were very realistic. Um, we uh, started with humans and then switched to robots. We got very good at um, getting um, uh, our automated system to generate and um, apply uh, sorry, and submit these applications in a way that mimicked the behavior of humans. So our, our robots actually filled out the um, applications in a way that imitates a human in down to the like level of detail of like the way that they're using the mouse on the screen and the rate at which they're filling out the application. So I don't think that it's a problem that um, we were being screened out by an automated system. One result that I didn't talk about very much was we actually also recorded which intermediaries are used, were used to um, host the application portal. And the variance in behavior across um, intermediaries is actually indistinguishable. This is the, the hiring platform intermediary. It's indistinguishable from zero in most cases. So it's um, it, the, given that these intermediaries are using very different technology to screen the applications, I don't think that we were um, detected and you know I don't think that there was an adversary that was trying to um, shield the um, the uh, company from the appearance of of bias thank you very much so John Min Lee has uh, two questions the first one is would it be, would it be possible that heterogeneity across firms is driven by some idiot thing idiosyncratic shocks which affect the labor demand and are correlated with African characteristics? Well, I, I don't think so. I don't think that that's what's going on because there were um, very large shocks uh, during the, the, our experiment lasted over a year um, across the five waves and we shut down for several months uh, when COVID first hit. And we actually can't reject that the biases are equal across waves um, within companies. So that's a very, like, you know, the companies got hit very differentially by COVID, and yet the biases were remarkably stable. And so I don't think that labor demand shocks are an important um, part of what's going on in our results. And of course, the, the demand shocks can't be correlated with our characteristics because our characteristics are randomly assigned. Thank you very much. The other question is that would it be possible that less profitable companies cannot afford diversity at work? I have a related question. So 
if you have thought about uh, relating the degree of discrimination by the degree of the competition in the product market or uh, labor market? We have looked at whether um, concentration is correlated. We, we can only measure concentration by industry, but um, we did not find um, the uh, con like standard concentration measures like HHI or the top four firm share to be strongly correlated with um, to be strongly of the industry to be strongly correlated with um, discrimination levels. Um, the whether firms you know can't afford diversity, um, that is not the usual economic story. But I mean, I can't I can't uh, rule it out. But uh, I mean, this is just a correlation. The correlation with profits. So this isn't you know necessarily causal. Um, it could. We don't. I think what I agree with is that we don't know which way the causal error arrow goes. So we don't know whether the discriminating is leading them to be less profitable or the less the lower levels of profitability or something associated with that are are leading to more discrimination. I I think there might be some of both. I think that it looks like the jobs that are discriminating more heavily are not very good jobs. Um, and um, I my own sense though, is that the, the mediating mechanism is more what I've mentioned down here, that a lot of companies that don't have, uh, that aren't very profitable, you know, in the retail sector or the auto sector, they don't have really sophisticated HR practices in place because they don't view these jobs as warranting them because they're just pretty straightforward jobs that don't require huge amounts of skill. But one thing that HR does, even if it, you know, irritates everybody, it slows us down and um, slowing us down can be important for combating um, the biases of individuals. The procedure can somehow can sometimes neutralize the biases of any one individual. Thank you very much. So let's uh, finish this uh, keynote lecture. To conclude this uh, keynote lecture, I'd like to thank, uh, I'd like to express my gratitude to the audience for their uh, discussion and to Professor Klein for this uh, thoughtful presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much.